Good evening, everyone. My name is Jackson Taylor, and I direct the prison writing program at Penn American Center. And I'd like to welcome you to this, our 42nd annual prison writing awards ceremony. And Lately, our program has come under fire from within our very own committee. And what's being discussed is that we're not more articulate about what our program does. And perhaps tonight's program can put a drop in the ocean to remedy that. We, as a committee, do suffer from a modesty problem. And because of that, I'm going to ask everybody in the audience who is a member of the committee to please stand up. Hetty, I see Claudia, I see other, others. There's, a, there's about 35 of us total. And the modesty comes out of a principle that we all sort of subscribe to that it's more important to put the names and faces and words of the people who are incarcerated than our own. So it's a kind of humbling process. And mentoring and writing to people and teaching through the mail is part of that. And what we learn, I think, is an awful lot about ourselves. And I, I think we often find and those of you who teach will know what I'm talking about, that we learn more from our mentees or from our students than we may be able to impart. And that can be good things and bad things both. One of our committee members you may know is a poet named Marie Ponceau. She's 93, and she very much wanted to come tonight. And we spoke, and I said, Marie, stay home. It's really cold. Uh, and in typical style, she said she wasn't afraid, and if this were Siberia, we'd be in boxer shorts. But nonetheless, I wanted to tell a little story in that about five or six years ago, we were sitting around, she and I, and we were saying, what is it we do with this program? What is it we believe in? You know, we've been involved with this for a long time. And she and I came up with, over a series of weeks, a sort of list and we published this list as one page of a handbook for writers in prison that we mail to prisoners free of charge anywhere in the United States if they write us a letter and ask for it. So the first exercise in writing is to write and ask for a handbook. But here are some ideas that we as writers and members of the committee agree upon. The first is that writing is a skill that can be practiced. And unlike many skills, writing well is useful in almost every avenue of employment, education, and of course, daily life. The second thing we agree upon is writing is a skill that generates other skills. We support more educational programming, not less. It is a well-proven fact that education reduces recidivism by high double-digit percentages. I really am proud of that because when educational programming got cut from the Pell Grants and as it comes under fire periodically, including the time we live in now, we have never as a committee wavered from that position that education is key. We also believe men and women who are incarcerated and who work in the prison industry should not come out worse than, the way, than they, when they went in. And I think the important phrase here is, and those who work in the prison industry as well, that they should not come out worse than when they went in. And we believe guards and other prison workers should be included in educational grants to counter the pressure of this work and also maybe to reduce some of the resentment that can exist around it. 
I'm going to skip ahead to the couple more. We believe warehousing and silencing any segment of a population is a bad and fear-based practice. And we believe in order for democracy to function, it is important to hear from every segment of the population, even those disenfranchised by crime. And those voices, which you will hear now, have a lot that they can teach us about who we are as people. Ladies and gentlemen, I give you our program. Good evening. It's such an honor to be here tonight. Um, this poem is entitled An Ordinary Prison by Elizabeth Hanson. She's in the Flavani Correctional Center for Women in Troy, Virginia. And my name is Jasmine. Peer into a prisonarium. We travel in a fishbowl. Push your ear to the glass and hear. A mumbled roar with shrill highlights, card shacks hunched over scores and crumbs, slapping cars and grunting with sly twitches. The surprise of a dog chewing its bone. As if this were an ordinary household. Inventory of the scene. Catalog is contraband of loss, tattered books, Spines broken, shelved, and bucketed. A tinted cabinet bulging with life locked away. A closet weeping through painted pores. Tables ornamented with plastic treasures. Our brooms, toys on display, and by my door a steam. We all stood to wipe away an ordinary household of hungry, bleeding women hunched over scores and crumbs, burning their hair straight, burning their lives down, burning their popcorn in a microwave, just like ordinary people on the subway. Thank you. Good evening. Um, the poem I'm going to read is Cultivation by Christopher Griffin, Texas Department of Criminal Justice, W.F. Ramsey Unit in Rochereman, Texas. My name is Randall Horton. <clears throat> Burlap sack snaps in the wind again. The turn rows grow longer. Along the way, days become bygones. Dandelions dancing in the breeze. Knees dig into loose soil. Toiling hands peel away a husk. Dusk meets us with a cool smile while flocks flutter aground. Around the hearth, our sorrows sup abrupt as slumber broken. Smoking ashes of dashed lives strive to drudge on. Listless, weary, clearly a near forgotten lot. Not lost, merely trodden under trust. Rusty umber clouds offer respite, desperate earth parched and dry. Skies blow kisses to leaf and breast, feast with thunder rolling over. Sour sower seas by their time, pinning to play a role in life. Strife is only baked clay crust just before it splits and crumbles. Humble beginning waits his turn, yearning to splay Mother Earth. Birth from the womb, stem and stalk, balking, breathing among the living, giving path to the fibers of need, to weeds along the dike, and worms alike. Thank you. Good evening. I'm going to read a poem called Midnight at the Manatee. It's by Joe Ricky Knight from the Rotorer Correctional Complex in LaGrange, Kentucky. My name is Erica David. For Dad. 
On the drawbridge, cars crossed between Bradenton and Palmetto while the tide ran out to the Gulf. You'd brought me out to your lucky spot, rigged me with gear, and told fishing tales. Your lantern hung above the breeze-rumpled river, drawing fish to the disk of light, shimmering on the murky current that dragged my line back into the fringe of darkness. There, huge snook lurked and waited for bait fish. After a long time of nothing much but watching the boxcars trundle and creak across the nearby trestle, my rod jerked, bent double from the strike, the snook fighting hard against the reel to break free until, at last, it lay spent atop the dark green water. Light glittered across its silver-gray scales. Thirty-nine inches from tip to top. It must have weighed, I bet, about forty pounds. You teased me as we passed another angler, offering to carry my fish from the bridge as though it was yours. Back at your apartment, your second wife, Rusty, wanted to take a snapshot of the prize. As I proudly held that snook up shoulder high, you seemed as happy as I had ever seen you. You pointed a thumb at your puffed up chest, but I shook my head no with hair flying and smiled when her camera flashed. Good evening. The poem I'm going to read is titled Echoes by Brian Maddock, who's in Arizona State Prison Complex at Santa Rita Unit in Texas, Arizona. She turned 71 under cardboard, snuggled against a rusty dumpster, crushing snow flurries before they melt. Now she sits at the bus stop, pats her tattered scarf, pretends to be someone. The young man at the corner is her fiance, Harold. 50 years ago, white powder blots out city stains, deadens her angry joints. A darker man joins the first. They mumble about bus schedules. The Indian lifts his arm, waves the hook where a hand out ought to be, and blames it on a woman. She stares at the graceful curve, that lack of aching knuckles. Coins click against it, ferried from steel toward flesh. Harold's open hand awkward claw in the cold, her belly a cave of echoes. Thank you. I'm Deborah Clearman, and I've been leading a creative writing workshop for women in jail on Rikers Island for the last three years with an organization called New York Writers Coalition. I also serve on Penn's Prison Writing Committee. And um, when I got this story um, from Penn with the address on the cover letter, I recognized the address, 1919 Hazen Street, Rikers Island. I didn't recognize the name, Samantha Abayas, but I've had dozens of women coming through my workshop and I thought, I wonder if she's been in my workshop. I started reading the story and immediately I remembered it in vivid detail. I knew what was coming next. I was so excited. I had no idea that Samantha had submitted this story to Penn. Um, it was in the summer of 2012 that she wrote the story in my workshop. I looked back in the records and discovered that the prompt for that day was to write about a betrayal. So I'm going to read the first part of her story and then pass you on to some other readers. This is Betrayal by Samantha Abayas. I didn't know that love could be so painful and leave you feeling as empty, weak, and alone as I do now. I met Tony when I was 19. I was wild-eyed and wide open, looking for love and finding nothing but one-night stands in the back seats of random cars that usually ended with me getting paid or getting the shit beat out of me. I'd lived that way for a long time, running the streets, being one of the true children of the night. The hookers, pimps, and drug dealers that ran the pavement of Hunts Point were my friends. 
Lucky for me, I didn't have a pimp. I wasn't hooked on any drugs, and I didn't always sell my body for money. I just wanted love, and I guess so did Tony. Tony came into my life on the heels of yet another one of my misadventures. I'd just gotten kicked out of yet another car when he pulled up in a midnight blue Jeep 4x4. It was the middle of winter, but I wasn't dressed like any of the girls who were on the stroll, who had barely enough clothes to keep warm. I had on dark washed skinny jeans, Converse, and a black wool coat with matching hat, gloves, and scarf. I was standing in the middle of the street, breathing heavily, having just tried to run down the ass who kicked me out of his car, my breath meeting the cold night air and turning to mist the second it hit, when Tony pulled up next to me. You lost, he asked, after rolling down the passenger side window. Not dressing like a hooker gave me an upper hand. I got guys to stop for me if they didn't think right off the bat that I'm a streetwalker. It was part of the game for both of us. No, I said, putting my hands in my pockets. You look lost, he said, staring at me. Even in the dark of the car, I could see his eyes. They were bright gray, almost like a cat's. Well, I'm not, I shot back, standing my ground. Most guys picked me because they thought I was easy prey, but I was far from it. What's your name, he asked me, his voice soft like velvet. I smiled. Emily? He laughed a little, the lines around his eyes showing a little. Well, Emily, I'm Tony, and even if you say you're not lost, you sure look lost to me. I giggled. You're persistent, aren't you? He smiled and my chest went tight. Yes, I am. Well, I said, taking a step closer to the car. Since I'm lost, you want to save me? The smile left his lips a little, and that's when I saw it, that hungry, needing look that all men get when they looked at me. I'd like that, he said after a moment. I opened the door and climbed in. The car smelled strongly of mint gum and his cologne. I felt myself get tight all over as he pulled away. I'm happy you found me, I said, looking at him. Good God, he was good looking a full head of jet black hair and strong features, nothing like the usual ugly mugs who picked me up. Me too, he said. Who knows how many sickos run the streets around here? I smiled. I'm sure you're not one of them. Again, the smile left his face a little. Of course not. We talked for what seemed like forever while Tony drove around. Just looking for the right spot, he said, when I asked him what was taking so long. Finally, he stopped. I'd never been to this part of the stroll. There was nothing but empty buildings all around us, and I got this crazy feeling that we were the only two people for miles around. I'd taken off my coat, and underneath I had on just a white t-shirt with black trim. Tony let me climb into the back seat first. Once we were both back there, he just looked at me, smiling a little, before reaching out and running a finger across my cheek. God, you're sexy, he said. I felt my cheeks get hot. You're not too bad yourself, I said, trying to keep my cool. He laughed, and I felt my knees go weak. Slowly, he leaned over and pressed his lips to mine. As the kiss deepened, he pulled me into his lap. I felt his hands all over me, running across my butt, up my back, and into my hair. Too soon, he broke the kiss. He looked back deep into my eyes with a hunger I'd never seen. I ran my fingers across his smooth skin, wanting nothing more than to have him inside me. I'm sorry, he said suddenly. I felt my heart sink. Great, I thought. He's chickening out. For what, I asked, wanting to save the moment. For this, he said, before driving the knife I hadn't seen deep into my stomach, before the world went dark. Like I said, I didn't know that love could be so painful, 
and leave you feeling so empty, weak, and alone as I do now, lying at the bottom of the Bronx River. But then again, it never really was love, was it? And next, um, Susan Rosenberg will read the second section of the story, and Gregory Lahaba will read De Lahaba. Pardon me. We'll read the final section, and it's excerpted a bit so that it doesn't take all night. Past. Someone once told me that not being able to breathe is a lot like not being able to love. It's just something you can't live without. I always wondered how that would work. I guess now I know. I saw a fish this morning. It was swimming close to the surface of the water. So when the sun hits its scales, it was like watching a rainbow being born. It was only in my line of vision for a few seconds, but in this cold and empty world I now call home, it was beautiful. It helps to think, to get my mind off the cold. I think about a lot of things, but mostly I think about how I got myself into this. My hunger for love really didn't start till I was about five years old. Both my parents worked long hours so I could have the life they didn't growing up. They didn't want me to know what it was like to go without, so they bought and gave me everything except love. When I started school, unlike most kids who would cry and fight and wouldn't go in unless they were carried, kicking and screaming, I went in and sat down and learned. I learned everything. I could, and then some. I think I was too smart for my own good sometimes. I didn't want a lot of attention aimed at me, so I downplayed everything from tests to homework. By the time I hit middle school, I was set in a B average and happy with how my life was going. Until the day I met Rory. The very first time we talked, I'd been sitting alone in the lunchroom reading a book when she came over, sat across from me, and gave me her million-dollar smile. She held out her right hand. My name is Rory King. What's yours? I took her hand and gave it a little shake. Her skin was soft and warm. Emily Knight, I answered. You know Rory is a boy's name, right? She looked taken aback for a second, and then she started to laugh. She laughed so loud and hard that the kids at the next table stopped what they were doing and stared at us. And from that day on, we were inseparable. Where she went, I followed, like a good little puppy. She showed me a part of myself I didn't know was there, things I didn't know could be real. All through middle school, we were known as the Soul Sisters. That's how close we were. When it came time to pick a high school, Rory and I sat down together and put the same schools on our list. Rory was a dancer and was so graceful that watching her dance brought tears to my eyes. The day we got into the same art school, we danced like two crazy people around my living room. I got in for art, I'd always loved to paint, and Rory for her dancing. That summer, before freshman year, our families decided to go on a big road trip together. Rory and I caught food poisoning from some truck stop diner and spent the rest of our trip in the hospital. That summer, and the ones that followed went by too fast for my liking. Before I knew what was going on, I blinked, and I was 17 and in love, but not just with anyone. I was in love with Rory. It must have happened between the food poison summer and Jack Coe, Rory's first real boyfriend, but I can't say for sure. Jack had been the love of Rory's life. He had been better than a good book and a cup of hot cocoa. But in the end, he was poison. In the beginning, like all good things, they were fine. Jack even went as far as to call me his soul sister-in-law, and even tried to set me up with one of his friends, a band geek with bad acne named Manny. But all good things must come to an end. And the first time Rory showed up at my apartment with a busted lip, I begged her to call the cops. 
but she told me that she knew Jack hadn't meant it and told me to chill and that she would handle it. He showed up the next day with a dozen white roses and she forgave him on the spot. I hadn't been so understanding. And then came the black eye, the almost broken nose, and then the broken rib. And by that time, thankfully, Rory had had enough and called it quits. After the broken rib, it had taken her weeks to be able to dance again. It had been about a month after she and Jack had broken up. We were having a girls' night in, complete with pizza, cookie dough, and a little Johnny Walker I'd gotten from my dad's keep, and every season of Sex in the City. We were sprawled out on my bed in the dark, looking up at the glow-in-the-dark stars my dad had put up when I was a kid and had never bothered to take down. Somehow we ended up on the topic of Jack. I just don't get it, she said. As much as she had had to drink, I was shocked she could still even talk straight. I gave that dick almost a year of my life, and what does he give me? A broken rib. The nerve of that ass. I laughed a little. He didn't just know how to handle you. I mean, you are the shit, you know? That got a little laugh out of her. The sound made my heart jump. You really think so, she asked, and I could hear the doubt in her voice. I rolled over so that I was lying on my side, looking at her. She was at an angle to me, laid out on my bed in one of her silky nightgowns, her hair flowing across my pillow like black gold. I knew that if I died at that very moment, I would die happy just for having known her. Look at me, I said. She rolled onto her side so that we were facing each other. Her eyes were sad, and it nearly killed me to see them like that. No matter what he did to you, you made it. He didn't break your spirit, he didn't break your soul, and he didn't break you. She smiled at me, and before I knew what I was doing, I leaned over and kissed her. It wasn't a real kiss or anything. I just put my lips to hers for a few seconds and then pulled away. When I did, she was staring at me, her green eyes full of shock and wonder. It took me a full minute or so to realize what I'd done, and when I did, I tried to move away from her, but she reached out and grabbed my hand. Please, she whispered, holding my hand a little tighter. Do it again. Tony. In other news, the police have found the body of 19-year-old Emily Elizabeth Knight in a remote part of the Bronx River. Miss Knight had been missing for more than a week before her body was found by a homeless man who had been fishing in that part of the river. Police are still investigating, but believe that Miss Knight is a victim of foul play. They are questioning everyone who had contact with Miss Knight on the night of her disappearance. We will have more on this story as it develops. I stared at the TV, but I couldn't believe it. I felt my hands go cold and my chest go tight. They found her, I keep thinking. They found her, and now they're gonna find me. I stared at the TV and at the picture her family had given the cops when she'd gone missing that the news was now using. She looked the same way she did the night I'd picked her up. Chestnut brown hair, hazel eyes, and caramel skin. I knew the moment I turned the corner and saw her standing in the middle of the street, she'd be the one. I knew that I had to have her no matter what. I tried to fight it at first. That burn that went through my whole body when the urge got too strong. But like the times before, I couldn't. So I pulled up next to her and asked her if she was lost. No, she'd answered, putting her gloved hands in her pocket. She wasn't dressed like the other girls I'd seen that night. She was well-dressed and healthy looking. But there was something about her eyes that caught me and wouldn't let me go. You look lost, I said. 
She stared at me. Well, I'm not, she shot back. She was playing hard to get, and I liked it. What's your name, I asked. She smiled at me and said, Emily. I laughed a little. The last girl's name had been Emily. Well, Emily, I'm Tony. And even if you say you're not lost, you sure look lost to me. She giggled, and it sounded like bells. You're persistent, aren't you? I smiled. Yes, I am. Well, she said, taking a step towards my car, since I'm lost, you want to save me? I felt the smile leave my lips a little. Could it really be this easy? I felt the burning get stronger. I had to do it soon. I'd like that, I finally said. She opened the door and climbed in. She smelled of roses. I felt the knife in my pocket start to burn. Soon, my friend, soon. I'm happy you found me, she said after a minute. I could feel her eyes all over me, and I didn't like it. Me too, I said. Who knows how many sickos run the streets around here? I caught her smile out of the corner of my eye. I'm sure you're not one of them. If only you knew, little girl. If only you knew. Of course not, I said. She talked while I drove around. She told me a little bit about herself, all things I knew were lies. A street walker never told the truth about herself, and neither did I. What's taking so long, she asked after I'd been driving for a while. Just looking for the right spot, I told her. She just smiled and kept talking. Finally, I stopped. We were close to the river so I could dump her easily when I was done. She'd taken off her coat and had on some trampy little shirt. Now she looked like the hoe she really was. I let her climb into the back seat first so she couldn't see as I took the knife from my pocket and slipped it up my sleeve. Once back there, I just looked at her. She looked so much like the girl that came before her. It made me smile just thinking of the ones before her. I reached out and ran a finger across her cheek where I longed to cut her. God, you're sexy. Another lie. You're not too bad yourself, she said coolly. I laughed before slowly leaning over and pressing my lips to hers, as sick as it made me to do so. I lured in, deepening the kiss before pulling her onto my lap. I needed her close. I ran my hands over her body, drawing her deep. It was time. I pulled away, and the look in her eyes was priceless. I needed it. And I could see in her eyes that she saw it, but not for what it really was. Suddenly, it hit me that it was wrong. I couldn't do it. I couldn't take this girl's life. But I had to. I'm sorry, I said, before I could stop the words from escaping my lips. I saw the confusion and frustration in her eyes as I slipped a knife from my sleeve and into her hand. For what, she asked. For this, I said before driving the knife deep into her stomach. She went out cold after that first hit. No fight, no screaming, the rest was easy. I hit her 12 more times, one each for the girls who had come before her. I cleaned up quick and got rid of her. After tying a rock to her legs and dropping her over some random bridge and into the river. After I drove back to my hotel, showered and slept like a baby for a day and a half. A few times I went to the spot I dumped her, and each time the burning inside up started again, becoming stronger and stronger with each visit. The rush I'd gotten from her hadn't lasted, and it was time to move on, but I couldn't. I turned off the TV, throwing the remote across the room, shit. 
I should have been smart. I should have been more careful. I was getting sloppy. Now I was going to rot. No, I said out loud, I'm not. I'm not going to rot. I ran over to where I'd left my new coat and took out the knife out of my pocket. I had it for as long as I could remember. I think she had given it to me, the first one, the girl with the black eyes. I shook my head. No, I couldn't go back there, not now. Still holding the knife, I went into the bathroom, stopped up the tub, and started to fill it with cold water. As the tub filled, I went back into the room, took out some paper, and started to write. I wrote it all down, everything. Everything I'd ever done, and every girl I'd done it to. When finished, I went back into the bathroom with the knife and with what I had written and laid it on the rim of the sink so when they found me, they would know. Slowly, I stripped off my clothes, letting them fall to the floor. I turned off the water, picked up the knife, and got into the tub. I knew the water was cold, but I didn't feel it. I sat there for a long while, just staring at the walls. Then I took the knife and ran it across both my wrists. I closed my eyes and let the world slip away. Now I will never rot. Patrick, Matthew, in case you were wondering. Uh, and we are going to read a mentorship correspondence uh, between John T. from Boston, Massachusetts, and Louis L. at the Salinas Valley State Prison in Soledad, California. And, and, and this is my first reading, so please be, uh, be gentle. Be gentle. <laughs> Dear Louis, I'm writing to ask if you received my original correspondence from May 31st. In case you didn't receive it, I attached a copy to this letter. If you aren't ready to share your poems, I'm open to discussing poetry in general, and I'm interested in hearing more about your artistic interests. I hope to hear from you soon. Sincerely, John. Dear John, <clears throat> it is very wise that you have written to me again. As proven prison life goes, your original letter was destroyed by the prison guards during a cell inspection. Additionally, I am now at a different prison with a new address. It is very fortunate that this letter has reached me at all. The kind of result that quietly begs for a poem to be written about, perhaps, in the echo-conserved spirit of my generation, I am reducing, reusing, and recycling precious paper sheets by writing back to you upon the paper that you have written to me. So please, don't take offense. If anything, smile for that young budding sapling spruce that may be spared simply because of this minor inconvenience of having you read between the lines, as it were. <laughs> I have long anticipated embarking on this prison writing mentorship with you, so much so that my excitement may lead to scattered thoughts, random musings, or arbitrary commentary. I hope that you will understand. Overall, I am aware that space is limited. Your time is valuable in this venture is to ensure that my writing skills are improved directly in relationship to your opinions and encouragement. Mentor, hyphen, a trusted counselor or guide, parenthetically, Synonym, coach, counsel, guide, lead, pilot, shepherd, show, tutor. Trust, hyphen, assured 
reliance on the character, strength, or truth, or someone, uh, truth of someone, or something, parenthetically, synonym, confidence, credence, faith, stock. Also, mentor, close friend, confidant, read my entire written body of work and offer substantive or stylistic suggestions, maximize my potential, advocate, advise me on technique. My prison mentality immediately compels me to place trust in no man. Trust is earned, if ever given. However, if I am to grow through you, then I must forego old notions of potential camaraderie. And since you've already shared your poetry and a little about who you are, I feel inclined to do the same. Bear with me. It has been a long time since I have left myself exposed, and I'm finding myself a bit guarded and defensive slash apprehensive where trust and reliance and vulnerability and artistic surrender are concerned. Or am I just thinking too much? Bah, let's get on with it already, shall we? <laughs> I guess that was the end of it, because I, I, I didn't have and that catch. You're, yeah, that's it. <laughs> And this is about the family down the road uh, by Patricia Prewitt, Women's Eastern Reception Diagnostic and Correctional Center in Vandalia, MO, whatever that state is, I'm sorry. <laughs> Montana, I guess. Oh, huh? Missouri? All right. Say, so I'm just. They turned them into two letters. I just, I'm, that, I'm that ancient, I'm sorry. Uh, <clears throat> Fire! Daddy called to the pre dawn darkness, pulling his glove south toward the Jackson place. I dropped my feed bucket to rush with him. Like yard gnomes, they stood barefoot in the snow, watching flames devour the old farm house roof. Our truck slid to a store on iced gravel. And we pushed past the night known clan to brave the hell. I hurled drawers of clothes and bedding out on the snow until Daddy roared, get out! Volunteer firemen arrived in time to douse the rock foundation, then spit and scratch. Dead-eyed statues stared where the house had been. A rust bucket braked with a squeal out front, hunking for the strangers to leap inside. Black exhaust strained the snow where they had been. Guilt heavy for a blessing, we rode home, haunted by this girl and offspring who seemed stunned but not shocked by their smoldering loss. Then Daddy's voice stabbed the silence with, that's the warmest that old house ever was. <laughs> Plaza, Andrew Jakes, Residential Reentry Management Center in Phoenix, Arizona. Today is not that good day. I do not want to die. I'm not a soul, but a seal in the company of seals. We lounge scattered in the dry fountain, white stone sculpted to look random and rough up like runes. A civic feature, very modern. They never turn on the water. Except sometimes SFPD comes slow and squelching, clip whoops, like a bull predator who nonetheless will drag off those of us who will not wake or leave our rocks. They turn on their windows of water then, and we go to sit in the brittle, crackling shadows across the way on the low granite wall along Market. A black wall deepening green, polished coal, unlike our dry fountain of ruins, rough and warm with daylight. 
You can look forever into ice. You can look forever and never see bottom. Then the parade passes the normal statue pavement, perhaps lined with citizens. The comforter has come, and Fed Schreiner may be a president waving, or Mother Teresa of Hollywood, somebody like that. The world is turned off again, and we return again to bicker about where we will spread our own greasy shadows, which coarse rock will it be, where we bed and dream, cheeks pressed against sun, stone surface of sun, our faces pale crossing, trumpets of lily petal skin. Hello, my name is Tim Small. Um, I help coordinate the program, and it's my hope that this piece, thank you. It's my hope that this piece will speak for itself. Unlike the impression many people have of the work we do, our days do not begin with security pat-downs or metal detectors. There are no armed escorts through sterile hall hallways or down noisy cell blocks. And most of us never see the inside of a classroom full of inmates. What we do is almost entirely clerical. It takes place in an office, at a desk with two computers, two letter openers, a filing cabinet, a glue stick, and a stack of envelopes. On the days we come in, there is usually a pile of mail so thick we have to pry it out of our mailbox. We spend the next several hours cutting through adhesive seals, deciphering penmanship, scanning letters for key words, and entering addresses into spreadsheets. There are also emails to answer, letters to write, manuscripts to file, correspondences to repackage. Some days we fall into a quick rhythm and manage to get through the whole pile in three hours. Other days, coffee spills, and we leave with a bigger mess than the one with which we started. Regardless, in nine months, we will file and respond to more than 1,000 contest submissions, enter almost 4,000 handbook requests, and maintain roughly 200 mentorships. What pulls us forward and keeps us from feeling like mice in a spinning wheel, are a few important deadlines. One, the distribution of manuscripts to a committee of judges. Two, the return of the committee's results. And three, the mailing out of notification letters to all the winners. This last task marks the unofficial culmination of our year's work. It is an exciting day. We compose and review the letters with fastidious care, making sure that nothing is misspelled or misstated, for we too are writers and know the significance of such a document. That this day always comes in the spring when the flowers are beginning to bloom and the sun resists setting is not a coincidence. This year, three weeks after the notification letters went out, I came into the office and found in our pile of mail a letter stamped, insufficient address. The name on the envelope was William Van Poyck, an inmate who received the second prize in fiction and who had won awards in previous years. My first thought was that we had copied down his address wrong or that he had been transferred to another prison. Perhaps he had even been released. But when I searched for his names in our records, the address matched. And when I entered his ID number into the Bureau of Prisons Inmate Locator, his name was listed next to Florida State Prison. So I took the next step, one we tried to avoid, and Googled his name. What I discovered shocked me. Van Poyck was scheduled to die by lethal injection on June 12th. It was June 7th. I had all kinds of questions. Why now, after 26 years on death row? And why was his letter sent back to us if he still had seven days to live? Was it a clerical mistake? 
did the post office error or was denial deliberate? Did the warden see the letter and choose not to deliver it? A week later, I read online that Van Poyck's last words were set me free. I immediately dug up his story, Death by Dominoes, and began reading it. The first sentence stopped me cold. When the assassins come, they kill everyone. I read this over and over again, trying to process its implication, to figure out if it were true. Then I took out his notification letter, the one that he never got to read. Congratulations, it began, that magical word that we all long to hear. I stared at it for a long time, neglecting the new stack of mail that sat on my desk, new requests, new manuscripts, new letters, and thought about how it might have affected his final wish, set me free. Might it have made a difference even to a man who knew that death was coming? Thank you. Dave, to know that we're celebrating them, but regardless. Death by Dominoes by William Van Poyck. I'm Eric Boyd. When the assassins come, they kill everyone. That is what you must understand. Death is coming. It's at the door. Though uttered weeks earlier on a different cell block, I still recall leaning forward in concentration, struggling to hear the words, striving to discern the meaning of any, conveyed by Wanamaker's frog-like voice. The old man didn't speak his words so much as he breathed them out in a guttural rasp, as weak as a politician's promise, like a man talking reluctantly through a mouthful of marbles. Weeks later, perched on an overturned mop bucket wedged in the open doorway of my single man cell, Wanamaker's enigmatic words were still gnawing along the margins of my mind, those whispered words. How was I to know they'd be so prescient? Settling back on my overturned mock bucket, my thoughts returned to the remaining four days separating me from freedom. I resumed the fantasy I'd been mentally playing out before being interrupted, visualizing a long dream about a South Florida fishing trip south of Chocoloxy, past the rotting gun club in Everglades City deep into the swaying expanse of emerald sawgrass prairies. I pictured the soft morning light blushing faint pink above my aluminum skiff as I meandered down a winding tannin-stained creek, the mist-shrouded banks flanked by lullaby pines, stands of silvery cypress, and where the creek merged with the bay, tangled thickets of red mangrove with their webs of gnarly roots and saw-crusted leaves. Along the banks, I saw the whirligig beetles ruffling the creek's velvet surface and glistening black and red salamanders nosing through the mud. There were emerald leopard frogs jack-kicking through the mossy duckweed, their Crayola yellow spots flashing like semaphores. I saw the egret the white ibis, and the green heron patrolling the shallows, and the roseate spoonbills languidly lifting up from the water like ethereal apparitions, rising puffs of strawberry and cream. Up in the trees, I saw the drab anagenas, claws tightly gripping the swaying branches, patiently drying their feathers. Their wings opened up like Dracula's cape. I heard the buzz of summer's insects and the screech of the rare Everglades sail kite skimming above the swamp, an elegant willowy winged tuxedo black bird boasting an ivory patch above the tail. I saw the drifting alligators, the basking turtles, and the toothy gar hovering in tepid waters, and I smelled the rich decaying muck permeating the sultry air. And out past the flats of the shallow bay, its aquamarine water glittering like crushed glass, stretching off toward the keys. I saw the gulf studded with sailboats, their pastel sails blooming like orchids in the cobalt blue sea. I stood tensely while every thought in my mind seemed to merge, crystallize, and then shatter like glass.
falling away and leaving nothing behind but an awful vacuum. Eventually, the screams died away. The fire seemed to burn forever. In 17 years, I've witnessed every kind of murder. Stabbed, speared, shot, strangled, manually and by garrote, poisoned, bludgeoned, mostly stabbed. I have a reel of these images looping constantly through my head. And for me, personally, the worst is by fire. Someone slips into your cell, fills your light bulb with gasoline or lighter fluid, and when you come in and yank your light cord, a vaporous, explosive fireball fills your cell, sucking the oxygen from your lungs and melting your flesh like cheap plastic. That's when you realize that someone has jammed your door closed behind you. Yeah, the fire's the worst. The inhuman screams go on and on until your falling heart reaches that null point where you stop hoping that he will live and begin praying that he won't. There are things worse than death. Sticks like straw stuck through plum trees, poles, and all the pieces of life caught in the turning as the sound of a train turns through hills, hollers, that quiet before the storm. When eyes search through eyes in a root cellar full of fear, spiders, it's air so unfamiliar, air pressure. Thank you. Well, thank you all for coming. And um, that is the end of the work that we're reading tonight. I've just, uh, I've been tasked with talking a little bit more about our program and what we do and why we hope you'll support us. Um, I think Jackson talked in the beginning and I think he said some of what I was gonna say, but I'm gonna repeat it because I think it actually bears repeating. Penn Prison Writing Program is the longest running prison writing contest in the United States. 42 years is a very long time. And so we, in this program, have ended up supporting and encouraging hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of prison writers. And I think one of the things that's been so important about the cumulative effect of this work, this contest that we run, is that we've helped people in the broader world recognize that actually prison writing is a genre, prison writing is literature, some of the prison writing is brilliant, like writing anywhere. Uh, and that has been something I think we've really taken a lead on in this time of sort of prison reform, the growing of prison reform, I wish, I hope. Um, and we've developed an anthology of doing time, I think it's in the back, of 25 years of the best writing of pen prison writing. And as you see, we advocate about what's going on in prisons in many ways, and the principal way is through all of the work. And I know that when William Van Polk was put to death this summer, uh, all of us on the committee were very distraught because there wasn't anything to do except to have you hear his work, which is both painful and challenging and very upsetting, but it's also what we're doing, what's happening with people in prison. So um, I think, you know, I want to also say that all of this work that the 35 people on the committee do is voluntary, voluntary labor. Nobody gets paid. This is because we believe that this is an important thing to be doing. Um, and I guess the last thing I want to say is that the writing 
behind the walls and listening to the writing behind the walls of the voices of the people behind the walls. Every single person, the 2.3 million people who are in US prisons today have a voice and have something to say. And we very rarely hear what they have to say. And as the real prison exposure begins and goes on, I think we can see it in the, even in the New York Times every day. There's a new editorial about something wrong with the criminal justice system. It's imperative that we also listen to the voices of the people who are inside. And I think that's something really critical about Penn. And I'm, I'm really proud to be a part of Penn. And I, I would hope and ask you all to support this program. We give $50, it's $50 to our winners. More, we give $100 to more. We, <laughs> I don't know, we give money to our winners and it is a token, a token of what they deserve. Uh, but we, we're hoping that in passing a hat and in having the envelopes that you have, you would support us and we would be able to raise the prize money tonight for the winners that you heard tonight. So please, please support this, support this project and um, this program. And uh, yeah, I guess, uh, I guess that's, that's kind of it. The last thing I want to say is that there's a petition going around and I hope you'll look at it. It's from a project that is going on in New York City now called Release Aging Prisoners Project. And uh, I'm not gonna go more into it. You can read the petition, but there is an effort to get people over 60 out of New York State prisons, of which there are thousands in, all of whom are parole eligible. So, this would be something that would start a trend, I hope. Okay, anyway, thank you very much for coming. Hi, um, yeah, I, I, I've been 10 years in the New York State prison system and I've been invited by uh, Deborah, who uh, 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 is a colleague from New York Writers Coalition. But he read a piece where the name Assassin came in and uh, as I lead workshops with the New York Writers Coalition, I just ran across this great cartoon that has the word assassin that I wanted to share with you. And it's Mahatma Gandhi, who is standing, who is sitting, you know, as he would sit. And it's Martin Luther King that he's addressing. And he said, do you know what the odd thing about assassins is, Dr. King? They think they've killed you. <laughs>